I encourage everyone to take a moment and breathe and take a tea cheers with a Jiri tea. A Jiri tea recognizes the beauty in shared stories and shared opportunities. Ajiri sources award-winning tea from Kenya, employs women in the region to handcraft the labels, and sends 100% of the profits back to the region to support orphan education. Save 10% on your order of Kenyan teas and coffee with the code BEAUTIFULLYHUMAN at ajiritea.com. A-J-I-R-I-T.com. Tea mugs up! Hello, and welcome to the Beautifully Human podcast. I'm Nick Sheesby. In this podcast, I speak with beautiful humans from all around the world, sharing with you their incredible stories, revealing the power in every human story to spread love and humanity to a world that is in desperate need of it, to show that we can all connect in beautiful ways, no matter where we come from or what we look like. What you will find out is that we are all beautifully human. Let's all be beautifully human. Hello again. Welcome back to the Beautifully Human podcast. Thanks for tuning in from wherever in the world that you are. Today, I am talking to Hani Sagari. She tells the stories of her life when she moved to the States from Iran and her parents' lives and how they got to be in this country as well. And then she talks about the friendship she made with some folks at some nursing homes and how that has motivated her to get into the field that she is in. And it's a truly beautiful story. We talk about so much more as well. It's such a beautiful conversation. She is such a wonderful human. I'm so excited for you to hear it. And I'm going to let her tell it to you in her words. If you enjoy this podcast, follow along on Spotify and on Instagram at the Beautifully Human Podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It just helps get these stories out to more people, which is fantastic. And as always, enjoy this conversation. All right. So I love to start these off and ask a very broad, overarching question and just t- say, Tell me the story of your life. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Where do I start? I, I'm a, an immigrant. I immigrated to the U.S. when I was six and a half, seven. Um, Iran had a war, an eight-year war between Iraq. So I was born during that time. My dad was in the U.S. pre-revolution. We also had a revolution in 79. So I am the byproduct of that, the post-revolution Iran-Iraq war. And yeah, my parents were separated from one another for almost 10 years. Um, and in 1979, I'd like to start the story here in 1979, when we did have the revolution, my mom's, um, all of her roommates were executed and she came back to her home and she saw it vandalized. So she called the police and she's like, I think we've been robbed or something. Our home's vandalized. And they arrested her, put her in prison. Um, college students started the revolution. So I come to find out her roommates were already executed and she was next and they, um, a classmate of her, she was a social worker at the time she had just graduated. And uh, one of her classmates approached her and said, if I could get you out of prison, do you think you could run these women's shelters? Because I know you have a very good rapport with these women while she was doing her rotations, you know, during her studies, um, can you take over these shelters? And She's like, yeah, not a problem. And uh, most of the women in the shelter were street workers at the time. So there were their options were either go in the shelter or get executed too, right? Wow. So, um, so what started with 60 women, this is 1980. Now the war starts and you have a flood of these widows of the servicemen that are also ending up in in the same shelters. And they're, the widows are very conservative. You know, these other women were not so conservative there's a clash between them. And so she thought like, how can I occupy their time? And so her craft was sewing. That's what she knew. And she was like, maybe I could do that. I could teach these women how to sew. And so she did. She like just started with, you know, thread and needle, everybody, you know, this is what you do. 
And little by little, she saw that the woman's skills were picking up. So she went back and she said, can you guys, to, to the um, State Department, and said, can you guys give us sewing machines? Can you guys give us a grant of some sort? And they said, well, you know, now that the war has started, we need military uniforms. We need um, sheets. We need so many things. Do you think your women can can sew these uh, these these things and she said oh my god absolutely give us the sewing machines and we'll take care of it and so without knowing anything a young 20 something year old um she set up assembly lines and essentially set up a factory so how could i not be inspired by this mother who was just a hero in her own right and and slowly these women were able to move out of the shelter some got better paying jobs but the the overarching theme was teach women skills and you could empower them to, to live their life in the way that they want. So we got remarried. Um, and I was like, as a little girl, she was my hero. And I was like, when I grow up, I'm gonna do exactly what my mom does, but bigger and better. And so when I came to the US around, what was it, 93, 92, um, I befriended all the, I guess my dad didn't know that it was a 50 plus community. He moved <laughs> into. It was like all old people. And so I befriended all of them. They were so welcoming. I didn't speak a lick of English. So hmm. I would go to, you know, Madeline's home and she would sit with me and practice English. Very patient. She would teach me arts and Richard would be, and teach me something else. And I had all these friends. So I would come home every day and say, oh yeah. I was with Madeline and Richard and my mom thought these were my classmates, right? <laughs> Until my birthday rolled around. She's like, invite your friends, these friends that you always talk about. I'm like, I don't know if they can make it up three flights of stairs. And she's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll ask. So sure enough, my birthday rolled around. We had all these, um, <laughs> the geriatrics that roll up inside and she was shocked to say the least. But right then and there, somewhere, like, I guess, that affinity for older people and, and the geriatric population, it was just in me and I loved it. I, I felt home and at peace. And so um, by the time I was, you know, like fifth, sixth grade, my friends started dying. <laughs> it's a lot of grief for oh, wow. yeah. a little kid to process. So that's when the idea and the seed was planted in my head. How can I make my friends live longer? How can I prevent, you know, other aging people to live longer and better lives? And so that's where my passion for the, the field of aging started. Um, I went to school, I studied biopsych and then biochemistry and gerontology. So that was like my, my career path and, and I mean, my education. And afterwards, when I came out, I was like, I wanna work in the field of aging. And so I did, I started my first home health care company and it grew and grew and grew. I think like, again, just like my mother, not knowing a single thing about how to run a business, what to do. I had 1.2 million that first year and I was so thrilled. I was like, wow, how did I do that? I think I didn't even know my accountant told me. He was like, good job, honey. You hit 1.2 and I was like, I did. Wow. And, you know, again, doubled that the next year and doubled it again. And, and, and it just, it was growing and growing and um, yeah, that, that's, that's where it all started. That's a little bit of my story. And, um, it grew to a point where it turned from the business that I was so passionate about and it turned into a staffing agency because that's what I had to do. I had to hire hundreds of employees to just run this and make sure they take care of the elderly. And, um, and I just like lost passion. That wasn't mm -hmm. why I got in, into the field. And then, um, by the time I was getting my patients, it was already too late. It was like, that's when it clicked. It was like, all right, aging starts much earlier in life. I got to get people and educate them and teach them about the process, the physical process of aging and all these things at a younger age. So, um, I started chiral approximately two and a half years ago. I mean, it's still like, you know, we're, we're still in the development phase. Um, and I'm incorporating a few aspects that I absolutely love, which is one is teaching people about the aging process. Um, and the other one is empowering women, just like my mother did by offering entrepreneurship to them for them to take this business and a turkey solution. Um, our products are all personalized custom skincare products. So 
we'll do all the back end, you know, fulfillment and R and D and development of the products, and we'll make it custom for individuals. And all you have to do is really do the marketing and, and selling. So it's a network marketing, it's a social selling model, but I love it. Um, that's where, where I am, you know, in a, <laughs> in a nutshell, I was able to summarize it. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> what a cool story. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. As you were saying that, like, I was trying to think, and it's a more, like, I guess morbid thing to think about, but when you said your friends were dying at such a young age, and I was like, man, I luckily didn't have to deal with friends dying mm -hmm. for quite a while in my life. And then, oh man, I can't even imagine feeling yeah. that, at that at that young age. Right. And then what a beautiful way that you brought that around. And you were like, you know what? aging i'm gonna go and i'm gonna learn everything about it and i'm gonna start this and i'm just gonna help my friends yeah it's so beautiful thank you thank and you. what okay so you were talking you kind of answered a question that popped up in my mind too because i'm fascinated by languages so how was it when you got over here when you didn't speak english how were the kids like how what was what was that process like it's interesting because I was talking, my husband's from Poland and he also immigrated to the U.S. at age seven. So we have a lot of commonalities in that wow. sense. And I find that they're, the children that come here at a younger age, I think in first grade, second grade, kids are super encouraging. They're like, they don't make fun of you. And I remember, you know, they, the kids would say, honey, say yellow, say yellow. And I would say yellow. And they would like clap for me. And they were so kind and encouraging and um, so yeah, I, I, I never felt like, but one thing that was interesting, I will say is the food I would bring to school. Um, I would open my lunchbox and all the kids had their peanut butter and jelly. And I had like kebabs and formosas and Damon <laughs> and all these stews and all the kids would be like, ew. So I started eating my lunch under the, um, the cafeteria tape, the, the benches, the table. Yeah. Uh, what do they call it? Yeah. So I started eating my lunch there. And then for a while, like I would first, First, I would eat it under the table. I would like literally sit down and open it there. And then they started telling me I can't do that. So I learned to put my lunchbox on my lap and slowly like eat my food in that way. So that was like, you know, the one thing I couldn't get past. But as far as language goes, kids are so nice. Yeah. yeah. So what I, th I think too, like as you were saying that, I was like, yeah, it's, it's probably a better time to start learning it because as a kid, you're just sponge. Like we're, you're learning about the world so every bit of knowledge that you're gaining is from your is coming in at that point so i imagine just like bringing that in was it was a good time for that to come in oh, yeah absolutely i think um versus coming here at like the age of 12 13 kids can right. be brutal right they can totally. be of you and i know this generation's a little bit different but you know <laughs> bullying was a thing during my time i think it's still a thing right yeah um, yeah it's still an issue but um i yeah I, I think i was lucky and fortunate to have missed that <laughs> to come here so much earlier yeah, definitely. And do what uh, what of your first like before you came here? What what all do you remember about growing up in Iran? So I went back after we immigrated to the US. We would go back frequently, like every 2-3 years to go back and visit our family. Um and I had over 120 family members on my my paternal side and same thing on my maternal so huge huge family wow. and it was just so much love and it's filled with lots of joy and love and i remember my childhood in iran like we didn't have this um you know like be careful going outside and playing in the neighborhood like there was just kids and packs and packs of children playing outside until seven eight it, it felt safe it felt um, it didn't, it didn't feel threatening in any way, but yeah, I did go back frequently. Um, and I just loved it. I loved the, the warmth. And, and so I, I went back after 13 years, um, maybe two years ago. So then there was a huge gap. I was in school and all these things, life happened. Um, and I went back and so much has changed in Iran. Um, I bet. Yeah. It's still, it still hasn't like 
changed it. It hasn't westernized the way, let's say, Dubai has or sure. um, Abu Dhabi, but it's still, it, it's changed a lot since I had last been there. That's yeah. so cool. And it's one of those places I think fascinates me because it's one place that we're told we're not supposed to go to. So like from me, my like curiosity standpoint, and I've, I've seen photos and everything and I would love to go, but I think it's also like that place where it's like, well, we're not supposed to go there with a U.S. passport. I don't even think we're allowed to go there. Yeah. Am I yeah. right? Unless, unless you have someone to sponsor you, but yeah, Iran just has such a rich history. I mean, you've got like one of the biggest civilizations of all time there and there's so much history and it was right in the middle of the Silk Road, right? Yeah. So we got a little bit of all the cultures as people totally. pass by and it's so rich and the people are so hospitable and warm. And I'm not just saying this as, as you know, an Iranian, um, when our American friends would go there and they would visit, they were like, they would be blown away by by how warm and uh, friendly the people are so and the cuisine's delicious i mean different regions have their own unique cuisine and um you should definitely visit i would i would recommend it I, if, if you can yeah yeah get a visa it's definitely on my list because i mean there's a lot on my list but that would that, that would definitely be on there i was i was in i was in poland early 2020 and I met a man who had spent like three months uh, just prior to me meeting him in Iran. And he was just like, it was like the best time. He's like, if I could move there, I would go in a second. He was from Spain, but he was living in Poland. And he was like, I want to move to Iran. Yeah, I got to figure it out. And I was like, totally want to go. And so uh, so um, what kind from from your family, what kind of what, what are like? typical traditions that 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 you would have yeah so we have noruz which is our new year um okay. and with noruz we have the half scene which is a setting of of seven items that start with an s um and each one represents something um you know you'll have the sick kit which is coins represents money in the new year and you'll have the sieve apple represent health so they're symbolic and this is this all stems from the zoroastrian um religion from god knows how many two thousand years ago or so um i hope i get the deep break, but <laughs> So it's, it's a very, um, very old tradition that's just been passed on generation to generation. And um, for those that know about Iranian history, um, we've had like so many people try to conquer and take over we the Arabs and you had so many people pass by. And this is that one thing that we've been able to hold on to that nobody can take away. And it's managed to live for over 2000 years. So it's very important to us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all about having family, friends gathered. Um, and for 13 days, each day, you're supposed to go and visit someone like mm. a family member of some sort. This, this is how they do it in Iran. And on the 13th day, you go outside. It's called Siz Dibida, where you take your green. You, you have this little green. Um, it looks like grass, but it's made out of uh, like lentils or uh, they're sprouts. There are lentil sprouts that you grow and it goes, it's part of your table setting, the, the seven S's. Um, and you take that, you go out and you try to put it in a body of water and you make a wish. You, it's kind of like letting go of everything and starting fresh. So that's a tradition that um, that's very important to us. And then we have Yalda, which is um, the longest night of the year in mm -hmm. December, December 25th, I think, 23rd, 24th, somewhere around there. And, and we celebrate that with pomegranates and poetry and um, poetry is huge in our in our culture. Like we have Rumi and Sadi and um, all these great poets. So we sit around and we, you know, read poems. So th those are the two holidays or traditions that that really stand out. Yeah, you know? that's so cool. I Thank just you. love I, I love different hearing and learning about different cultures. It's what, I mean, I miss so much about like during COVID was being able to travel and just go and be in new places. Um, you also had said, or you said that your parents were separated for 10 years. Mm -hmm. How, like, how did they, where were they separated and how did they find their way back to each other? So my dad, he got his university education in the U S and it was, it was, customary, I guess, where people are educated in the U.S. and they would come back to Iran. This is pre-revolution. But 
when the revolution happened, he couldn't go back. You know, he didn't want to go back to this sure. new country that, that is just starting over and things are changing. But uh, my grandmother called my mom and my dad and said, I found a woman for you. My, my grandmother, long story short, but they stopped my mom. They saw my mom's this 5'10 beauty, um, which is, you know, very tall for most Iranians. And so they followed her home. They met her. They saw her and, and they followed her home. And the next day they rang her doorbell and said, we have a son for you in America. <laughs> And to my mom's like, oh my God, leave me alone, close the door. And they just kept coming back like marketers. <laughs> um, and until my mom's like, fine, I'll meet your son. And at this time, um, she really did want to leave Iran. I mean, it was just not a good place for women. Um, and, sure. you know, the, 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 the revolution had changed the government and so forth. So she wa was trying to leave. And I guess the idea of America was very appealing. And, and in our culture, I mean, especially back then, the idea of um, an arranged marriage was not like super crazy. Um, mm. You know, people would just meet for the first time or they would date a couple times and they would get married. That's how you did it. Um, and it still happens till this day. So my dad came back from the US to meet my mom and he fell in love. And within two weeks, they got married. Uh, and he went back to the U.S. and said, I'm going to try to bring you back. And I guess it took 10 years for wow. the paperwork to clear and for her to get her green card. And and during the time I was conceived. So I spent that. That's how I spent the first six, seven years in Iran until we wow. were legally able to come to the U.S. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Where in the U.S. did you what was your was your father at? Yeah, so he started in um, in uh, South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina. Then he moved to Louisiana. But he said there was, I mean, this is when the hostage crisis was happening. And he was like, people were so racist. They were like burning his home and they were putting, you know, threatening messages in front of his lawn. So he was like, I've had enough of the U.S. I'm going back home. And one of his buddies called and said, before you go back to, to Iran, why don't you give the East Coast a try? Like New Jersey, New York, it's very diverse. People are different. Why don't you come out here and before you head back? So he went to New Jersey and he was like blown away how different it was from Louisiana um, and decided to stay. So when we moved to the U.S., we lived in New Jersey, North Jersey, okay. Verona. Um, yeah. And that's where I spent the first, you know, 18 years of my or I, until I was 18 and moved out. Wow. Yeah. And I followed in my parents' footsteps <laughs> and then I got married after three months to my husband. <laughs> I met him in a nursing home. I was working there and he was he was in a resident. Um, he was an engineer. We had a we had a project. So I met him and same thing. He kept like coming back and <laughs> harassing and <laughs> until I was like, fine, I'll accept a date. And so when we went on our first date, he explained like, listen, I think I'm going to go to grad school to get my MBA in Michigan. Would you be down to come with me? And I was like, well, all right. I, but I guess, I think we have to get married. Like, I don't think my dad, I've never introduced a guy to my father. I think we'll, you have to at least like get engaged. So he did, he proposed three months. Um, and then we moved to Michigan. We did like a small ceremony, moved to Michigan, and then had our bigger ceremony two years later. Wow. So that, um, <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah. And then from <laughs> Michigan, we moved to Delaware for our first business. We moved to Delaware and it was either going to like Portland or Delaware because we needed a state that was tax-free that, that had no sales tax. Yeah. I could talk about that business a little, but Anyways, we decided to go to Delaware because it's pretty equidistant from a lot of major cities, from Baltimore yeah. and New Jersey, and we could be closer to our family. So we spent about six, seven years in Delaware, and I was traveling back and forth to California because we have one of our locations here until I finally decided to settle down. Um, and yeah, we had my husband and I were kind of separated at the time. It's like, I'm going to go to California until we figure this thing out with our marriage and <laughs> Um, but he eventually decided to join and nice. yeah, we've been here since. Wow. What a, just bouncing all over. That's amazing. I, know. <laughs> I, I love know. that. Thank you. 
Um, I was actually going to ask how you met your husband. I think that's so cool. It was three months. It's like, get in there. Let's get yeah. married. <laughs> it's cute because he proposed on the roof of the nursing home and he had one of one of our cutest residents who was like my, you know, my friend. I would bring her um, wontons, crab ragoons, and she was like excited and she would come back. She would be like, all oh, the ladies are so jealous that I got crab ragoons from you. They were so jealous. So um, he knew I had this connection with her. Estelle was her name and she passed away. But so he had Estelle hold the ring and like oh, wheelchair it over. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> <so> dude. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. That was the proposal. <laughs> oh, how cool. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I love that he took, I love that he took the care to be like, that's her friend. Let's get her involved. Yeah. That's so cool. I love that. I mean, it was so fitting. I mean, it just fit with my entire life yeah. story and, and my passions for, for the, the aging. And yeah, it was, it was just perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> I love that so much. Oh man. That's so neat. What a fascinating story. I just love, I love the culture, the history that you have such a big family over there. That's so incredible. You. Are you, um, are you going to be able to get over there soon to see them or do you have any plans to go back? I mean, I have two children now. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so during COVID I, I had another one, um, but I also have a toddler and I don't know how their passport situation. Cause I have, I'm a dual citizen. Oh, okay. I have an Iranian passport and a U.S. passport. My, and my husband um, has to get his Polish citizenship and that way, in that way, he can come to Iran and get a visa on the spot. But I don't know how it's gonna work for the kids. So I have to like figure out the passport stuff and I wouldn't leave them, they're too young right now. But yeah. definitely in the next couple of years, I would love to, I would love to take them and show them, you know, where I'm from, where my culture and my heritage, right? Totally, um, yeah. So, yeah. Another fascinating question that just popped into my mind is, are you teaching them Iranian and Polish? Yeah, so because my husband and I speak English to one another, right? Um, it, it's, yeah, we've been a little lazy with it, <laughs> but I do, I try to speak Farsi and the grand, grandparents when they're around, um, my, my mother-in-law speaks Polish. Um, you know, dobrze, dobrze. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, we're trying. I would love to. I, it's, it's that thing that I wouldn't want them to miss out on. Yeah, totally. Um, but it's hard when we're communicating in English sure. and the kids are around most of the time. Like, how yeah. do you we sneak in the Farsi? And, and right, try. right. But I would love to. I would love to send them to schools. And in Los Angeles, there's tons of, I mean, we have like the largest Iranian population outside of Iran, the largest wow, diaspora. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure there's schools and you know places I could take them. <laughs> yeah, I just think that that's such a like. If if I could go back and tell young Nick anything, it would have been to say like, "Yo, be a language nerd, dude! Like, learn all the languages." But yeah. it just wasn't it wasn't taught to me of of any importance to it. It was just mm -hmm. like, "Oh, take Spanish if you feel like it, or French if you feel like it." Mm -hmm. So I think that that. That would be such a cool thing for for those those children to have is all those different yeah. languages. That You're, right. Cool. You're right. You're yeah. right. To get them on the apps, there's got to be some apps that like, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're sponges, like you said. They'll they'll. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll pick that up. I mean, I it's amazing when I just see a kid grab a phone and it's like, just like the kids just bopping around on it. I'm like, man. Oh yeah. I wouldn't even have known what to look for as a kid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my two year old grabs my phone and he like goes through the videos on YouTube. I'm like, holy moly, this generation what they yeah. have. And you know it's funny, um, we could talk about this, but like it actually worries me a little bit because it's like he doesn't like this video, so he goes to next. And it's like, where is the atten the attention span? They're learning totally. from such a young age, like to just quickly go through it and um, yeah, and it's so important, I think, like to, to really focus and play. And I try to take away the phone and the television as much as possible to allow them. But you know, it's inevitable at some point they're going to get that phone in their hand and they're going to be part of the next culture, right? Like, it's like, yeah. Well, right. yeah, but it's scary. Yeah. yeah, I think about that a lot when, like, 
even just even bands now i'm like it's so hard in a in, in that industry to like you have a hit and say like hopefully covid never happens again or something like it doesn't happen again but like bands that had a massive hit in 2019 and 2020 was like their year to go and have the big tour and it's like the attention span of people is like oh it's gone <laughs> or i mean yeah. like you said just like no i don't like this one what's next what's going to entertain me immediately and i heard right. somebody talking the other day and it was like their kids were struggling to listen to a full song and it mm. was like a four minute mm. song and it was like yeah i like the song but like i heard two minutes of it so let's go to the next yeah. and i was like no, totally man it is just wild like I don't know. It's it, there's such a change with technology, and I, I see the good, of course, in it. But like, there is that part of that culture where it's like everything has to be so fast. And I mean, I remember getting internet for the first time and being like hearing the dial up, and then I mean, <laughs> the AOL, yeah, the you discs, like <laughs> yeah, totally. So it's it it is. It's so different, and it's amazing you're seeing it already with mm -hmm. a two year old child. Yeah. No, it's, it's scary. Almost. It's like a dopamine hit. Like, let's go. I will say that there is a baby shark remix. He would love that thing. <laughs> and I think they have it like, it's like baby shark. Do, 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 and it goes on for almost an hour. I don't know what remix it is. And he'll just get mesmerized. Wow. All right. So that, that one. There you go. Song, yeah. <laughs> over baby shark oh, yeah i can imagine <laughs> there's a, a i have so many friends that have kids and i'm like the patience level of a just being a parent is pretty impressive but also just like what you're listening to that's going to appease a kid is mm -hmm. it has to just get like oh my god like i cannot watch this movie again i cannot listen to yeah. baby shark remix for another hour of my life yeah <laughs> I remember I was pregnant and my cousin was the first one. He was like, oh, when the baby's born, you should play Baby Shark. And I was like, what? So when he was born, he was like, did you play in Baby Shark? And I was like, never heard of it before. And then now it's like, have I heard of it? <laughs> I don't know. I've heard it <laughs> to, the, to the point of nausea. Oh, my <laughs> God. It. Yeah. How was it? How was it with children that young for during COVID? Or was it kind of just sort of normal? So my son, um, because I have to work, I mean, I, by the time he's six months, and I don't have family here in, in, in California, our family's still in New Jersey. Um, they're trying to like retire and move out here. But um, I've had to put him in daycare and, you know, her daycare, this particular, this lady, she has daycare out of her home. So she was still able to watch children. So my son didn't really feel it. And we did a lot of outdoor activities. Like, yeah. you know, it's California. Um, you, you, there's always things to do outside. So we did, you know, spend a lot of time in nature and doing these activities. So it wasn't too bad. But I know for a lot of school age children, it's been terrible, right? Yeah. They've been locked up all day. Yeah. can't imagine and for the parents to now have to work and be a teacher and a mentor and a this and a tutor uh, i can't imagine what they're going through right that's like your your time away of like just go to school and learn so i can like whoo, take a breath yeah oh yeah i mean right now it's pretty hard with my youngest he's four months old um mm. and we bring him to work with us every day but it's like I can't type with one hand anymore. It's getting to that point and he needs to be held all day. But I also don't want to send him to daycare yet. Yeah. It's still too, too soon, at least six months I'd like to spend with him. So um, it's tough. It's tough being a working parent with us. Totally, yeah. You make yeah. it work somehow. You figure yeah, it out. You feel, yeah, yeah, you'll figure it out. You can't ever think it. Just go with right. the flow. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about your... The, I love I love that your pat like where your passion came from. I think it's so neat. And so when you started learning about aging, like what how did you take it from like the knowledge point to where you are today? Like when when you were in school to like putting it out there? What was that process? Yeah, like? so it was interesting when I graduated grad school, the options were go into research um or go into a medical profession, right? But I found during my, my 
I worked at that nursing home from the time I was 16 all through college. So I was there for you know six to eight years at this particular nursing home. And I saw that um, what these people were missing, our residents were missing. After everyone would go home at four o'clock, I would gather them up in the corridor in the middle and we would sing songs and I would give them attention. And it was like, that's all they craved. They just wanted someone to interact with them. So when I graduated, those were my options, go into the medical profession or go into, and I wanted to do something that was applied, right? And yeah. um, meaning where I could have the most impact and influence and what I initially started off doing was being able to um, maintain baseline for individuals who had Alzheimer's. So um, during my time in school, I was part of this program called, um, it was a beta program that started at Yale and they brought it to the University of Michigan Hospital um, where you, um, patients that come into the hospital, elderly patients usually experience delirium within the first couple of days or confused. And so, so through a slew of activities, you could prevent delirium from happening. And so I was like, what if I, I bring this home into the home setting, you know, for individuals who have Alzheimer's and we maintain baseline. And so I did do that, but, um, the program was just not easily replicable, <laughs> easily able to be replicated. So, um, you know, we, I had to go from that being a niche to just a broader home health care type of setting, but I wanted to have ultimately have an impact on people's lives and what, what more than being in their home and the intimacy of their home. And now you get that one-on-one -on -one and you could do activities and so much more. So I thought that was the ultimate way to have impact. Um, but again, what I realized was it was too late. <laughs> I got to start earlier. So sure. And part of, and I, I think I mentioned that uh, my business is a network marketing company. I don't come from that world. I knew nothing about network marketing. And actually the first time I pitched this concept to a friend, I was like, it'll be great. We'll have these educators, we'll call them educators or consultants, and they'll teach people about the process of aging. And then, you know, if they sell a product, they could earn money from it. Why would I pay Facebook and Google? And then if somebody below them, uh, sell the product and so I was like yeah that exists it's, it's been around for like you know decades it's called mlm and i was like oh, <laughs> what's that i was like isn't that a ponzi scheme <laughs> that right. was my first. isn't that what like the pyramid schemes are and it's like no 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 so i did a lot of research and i realized there's so much good that can happen from network marketing and that's where i really like i was like oh my god i could have a lot of impact if i go into this into this world, I could, I could one offer jobs to women, have the impact on women's lives that I always wanted to have. Um, and then also my consultants can become educators. They mm. can go in the field and teach people about the process of aging. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that that's kind of the model that we have. Um, and part of the reason we have the products that we have is because in order to really, I, I'm so tired. Again, my, my background's in the sciences, but I hear like all these gimmicky scams, reverse aging overnight. And it's like, no, it doesn't work like that. So I was like, if I could have the most effective anti-aging product regimen, what would it be? Well, it has to be personalized for you, right? Like right. you have to start with an alpha hydroxy acid, beta hydroxy, retinoids. Those are the most effective stuff, but you can't just assign one thing for everybody. So it has to be personalized. And that's where I went through this journey of, okay, like we got to custom make every formulation. We have to adjust the pH for every individual. We have to adjust the concentration. And it um, hasn't been done in the world of network marketing. I mean, it's a very new concept. And what I'm finding is there's a lot of education that goes into it, believe it or not, like totally. explaining to people what personalization is, personalized right. skincare. Um, but I think that's the future, to be honest. That's, that's it. That's going to be, I mean, like we went from having our iPods with our music library to yeah. now Spotify knows exactly what song we're going to play next, right? Like what, what we like. So why wouldn't we apply that to every aspect of our lives? And, you know, we want to talk about a sustainable future, sustainability. Like why are we putting so much packaging out there when we could just custom make things for the individual, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of good that can come from personalization. We could get rid of a lot of the the pol polluting of, of our earth with things that we don't need. And um, yeah, see, I mean, it could happen in food, the food industry. There's a lot that can happen with personalization. It's just the beginning. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think it's I think it's a really important concept too of what works for you doesn't work for me, right? And that's that's just pretty in a yeah. broad sense of it of not everything that works for one person works mm -hmm. for everybody. So I think yeah. it's really beautiful that you're like working with that person and saying, "Okay, here's who you are. We'll make something personal for you." No, no, no. I, I was saying if you go to a dermatologist and you want something effective, they would prescribe, you know, a, a certain prescription just for you. So why wouldn't we do that, you know, with normal stuff, right? With with our regular skincare regimen. So that was yeah. the concept, yeah. Well, that's so cool. I, I think it's I think it's a really beautiful way to do it. And I think it's funny too, as you were saying it, of like teaching people how to like get the concept of like personalization. And it's like, it's funny that that has to be relearned because it's been pushed to us of like, yeah, here's this one thing. It will fix everything. Here you go. Right. Right. And now it's like, no, 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 let's let, let's look at people. And then, yeah, we can start to be more sustainable because it's it's working for everybody and it's like mm -hmm. the way we've just been programmed to not even think about that and then to like flip the switch on it and go yeah let's personalize it it's pretty amazing and it, yeah. it's it seems like it could it's, it's a pretty simple and like when you think about it like oh yeah it should be personalized to you but like it just hasn't been done right right yeah it hasn't so there's there's a learning curve but I do think the future will go that way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like I, I mentioned in, in the last business I was with, and we had hundreds of staff members taking care of our, our patients and our clients. And I saw that like, oh my God, these women are working so hard, but I can't give them the means and the, and, and the income that they deserve. I mean, the margins in healthcare are so minimal that you're, you're kind of capped. You have to, you have to cap people. And I would go back and tell them like, you could go to nursing school, you could become an occupational therapist and so forth. And a lot of them couldn't do that. Right. They, they had to work. They were single parents. So I was like, next business, I'm going to make it so that people have infinite earning potentials. And I feel like in this world of network marketing, I know it gets a really bad rep, but there's so much good that comes out of it. Like you create your income potential. So a lot of people are entrepreneurial, um, they're not entrepreneurs, but they have entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial spirit. So if someone could just give them the keys, the tools they need, the back end, make it simple enough, they could run with it. So um, I think that's, that's one thing, one other thing that we're offering right now that I'm very proud of. Not only can these, are these ladies educators, but they also have a chance to have, you know, infinite income potential, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not everybody does, but they can. That, right. That there. Right. Yeah, it's nice that it's like, I get it. Some people want to work their ass off and right. make a shit ton of money. And some people are cool making what they make and yeah. not really pushing it. So it's nice that it's you have the option. You can personalize it for yourself of what yeah, you make. exactly. <laughs> and what's nice is like, we'll do everything. We'll do the personalization, send things out. They, all they have to do is the, the marketing and and the sales process, but you're going to have thick skin. I tell you for totally. marketing and sales. Oh my gosh. Like we were talking before you got to be able to handle rejection oh, <laughs> over man, and over man. all day. So it's not for everyone. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, as people are learning more about skincare and learning about this personalization, like it's, it's hard for people to learn it on your side of it, but also the people who are buying probably have a whole learning curve of, oh, this is new. It's actually for me kind of yeah. figuring it out on their own. So it's probably a, oh, I mean, a massive learning curve for everybody involved in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing well, while we were building out the website, it was like, if somebody comes to our site, learn something, doesn't buy anything, I've done my job. So True. that's yeah. been part of our core pillar from day one, um, educate as much as possible. So we have like our ingredients page, for example, every single one of the ingredients that could go in your bottle is there. And it's broken down in multiple categories, antioxidants, vitamins, whatever it may be. And the card flips over, you get a little mini definition of what it is. And then if you want to read more, you could click on it and go to the scientific journal that, that wrote about it. So I just wanted to make it as scientific as possible, as yeah. educational as possible. 
um, and actually do some good, you know, totally. all that. if I could educate, that would be awesome. Um, yeah. I think that's a good plan for just yeah. in general. I think we, we could all benefit from a lot more education and people learning more <laughs> in a broad sense. I, I think it would help. Um, all right. I'm going to change gears a tiny bit on us. And we were talking about traveling uh, before we started rolling. And I ask everybody on this this podcast this question and take COVID restrictions aside and all that. And if I came to you and I had a plane ticket to anywhere in the world, where would you go? Gosh, I feel like I went to all the places I really, really wanted to go. I spent a lot of time in Vietnam, which I oh, love. Cool. I, I recommend everybody go go to Vietnam. It's such a vibrant, thriving city. And people, the, the spirit in Ho Chi Minh is just like electrifying. And the coffee is amazing. Um, but honestly, if I could, if I could be honest, I would want to go to an island where my family from Iran all around the world, because we're, we're just so spread out. I have cousins sure. in Germany and, and everywhere I could gather them up and we could go to this place and all be reunited finally. Um, but an actual location, <laughs> it's not a fantasy. I mean, I think that's pretty um, rad. Yeah. But. Yeah. I've never been to Australia, so I would love to visit Australia, New Zealand. I yeah. think the yeah, na the nature and 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 yeah, I, I would love to visit visit that that region. I haven't been there, but same. Think, yeah, how about you? I, I'm curious to know where would you go. Man, it, I think it changes so much every time. Anytime I meet new people or I find out about new places, um, I've always been. I've been fascinated by like Morocco. I really want to go to Morocco. I, I've had a fascination with Georgia, not the not the state, oh, the like country. In Russia, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It changes, and then uh, the the more people that I know that are like from Africa and like actually like a, a safari would be cool, but I'd rather like go meet my friend who is from Zimbabwe and like dig in and like meet some people and like i met this amazing man on on my podcast he's from kenya and he was talking about the village he came from and i was like yeah. i would just love to get in and just like really truly meet people so i think it changes so i don't know it i think final answer i'd probably say zimbabwe to go see my buddy Stuart, mm -hmm. and then have that. him have him show me around i'd be like yo yeah. You know where to go. Let's go. Take me around. Introduce me to people. Like I want to. I just want to meet the people here and dig in. So I think that. Yeah. I think that'd be mine at this point. No, you're right. You're right. Like I, I, I missed Africa. Yeah, I have a lot of friends from Ghana. I would love to go see. Totally. That, yeah. That part, the Ivory Coast. And I yeah. Would love to go there. You're right. The That's heart. The heart and the joy that I that I have of everyone I've met from, from any region down in Africa, I'm just like, Oh my God, I want to meet more people and just get involved in the culture. And I think it'd be pretty amazing, but same, like you said, Australia. And I've, I, I know a ton of people from Australia and it's just like, it just seems like such a down to earth, really nice place. So I would love to go to Australia too. That's, that's on my list. There's not really many places that aren't on my list though. So <laughs> Yeah, the flight was just a little brutal when I was on the East Coast, but I think I'm closer to it now that I'm in LA. Yeah. Um. So I always ask this too: What was the most surprising place that you've been to? Hmm. No surprising. Surprising in what way? Any surprising. way that surprised you? Food. Yeah people, well, culture, horrible, wonderful. Well, I, I was, I've, I've been blown away by the Vietnamese culture. It wasn't what I expected. They're just so warm and so resilient as, as, as people, but China as well. I've, I've been, I've traveled all through different regions of China and cool. um, I, I really love the Chinese people and culture. And I've been surprised by that. Um, I guess you come with your own, set of ideas of how a, a particular culture is and when your stereotypes and all these things are broken you're just like wow it opens you up um 
especially the Cantonese culture, very warm, mm. believe it or not. And, and the cuisine's delicious. Um, but Jordan, when I went to Jordan, it's, it, obviously it's in the Middle East um, as well. So I'm familiar with the culture, but we did have, like we were driving with a friend's family member and all of a sudden you have all these gunmen and masks, you know, it's scary. They, they tell you to get out of the car and you're like, oh my God, am I going to make this? So it was a little surprising, but yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, I would like to go to Israel. I mean, I, I don't think I can, maybe I can, but I would love to see that region of the world. Right now, obviously it's in turmoil, but once yeah. things calm down, I would love to go there. I have a lot of Palestinian friends, Israeli friends, so I, I'd love to see what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, same. I I was living in Denmark in 2019 and I was I was only there. I was just I was working, but I I was like still having to leave and come back every 90 days. So, um one of the trips that I was going to take, but then I got another job and I came back to the States. I was going to go to Tel Aviv and I have a friend from there and she was like if you come here, I'll take you around to all my favorite places. I'll introduce you. And I was like, oh, my God, I wish I mm. would have gone at that point. But now I do. I do really want to go back. I think it would be yeah. amazing to check it out. Yeah. And have you been to Turkey, Istanbul, Ankara? I've been to Istanbul and it yeah. was amazing. That was really cool because it was the first time I was in a full Muslim culture. And mm. it was just really what really struck me there was. I didn't necessarily know about the calls to prayer. So mm. when they started happening, I was like, I kind of heard it before, but I didn't know the respect level that was that was put onto it. And I thought that was really amazing that even if people who you talk to, like I would talk to people right after and they'd be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really into the religion or I don't really do the prayer, right. but the respect level was really, unbelievable like you were like people were silent and no matter where i was it was like when it was happening it was just like reverence for it and i, mm -hmm. I thought that was really beautiful that it was like even if you were like not my thing you still right, put right. massive respect to the people that were doing it so yeah. i was blown away by istanbul i i absolutely loved it i spent five days there mm -hmm. which wasn't enough but it was still right. amazing and like the mosques were incredible. And I met a man there that like, I talk about languages a lot. And I think he really ignited that, like reignited a passion about languages. He was selling hot air balloon rides. And I was just thinking here, it'd be like, oh, well, I sell hot air balloon rides, whatever. But like, it was amazing watching this dude. He would, he would like come up to me and he'd say in Turkish, he would offer it. And then I would say, oh no, sorry, I don't, I don't speak the language. And then he'd be like, oh, hey, he'd know I <laughs> spoke English. And so he flipped into whatever language these people were, were going by. And that was his sales pitch. He, he would speak in his native tongue. And so if someone spoke Turkish, he would <laughs> speak to it. them. But whatever language they came back to him with, he would jump into their language because he knew yeah. 13 languages. Oh, wow. And so like it's when crazy. he took a break, I like when he sat down to like chill out for a second I went over and I was like how many languages do you know and he was like I know 13 and so like because I know those fluently I can pretty much like if they're kind of an iteration like I can speak with most everybody and I was like oh my god incredible I mean imagine the, the world that opens you up to right the I know language. I was thinking yeah. oh, for him I was like dude you could go into any company and be like i can sell anything for you right i can right. talk to everybody yeah give me a job done yeah, i don't need a resume out, right right You're i don't need a resume i'll go in <laughs> i'll go to china i'll go to mexico and i'll just speak their language mm -hmm. uh, i was i was blown away but yeah I, I i absolutely loved it i loved istanbul then i went through eastern europe and that was really fascinating and amazing and the people like i just love the people that i've met everywhere mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. it's just I love going to different cultures and different places and just digging in and meeting locals and just having conversations like that. Absolutely. Do you, do you speak any other languages? Sadly, I don't. No. Yeah, it was it was it wasn't presented to me in any significant way when I was younger and I just didn't pay attention. 
And so since then, I just haven't taken it up either. I mean, I do my Duolingo and stuff, but I think I could read more than I could speak anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm making progress slowly, oh, slowly, okay. slowly making progress. Yeah, I mean it's 2021, and you could set it yeah. as a. I'd like to learn Spanish. I I think I have to <laughs> being in LA, and you're just so limited in communication with people yeah. when you don't speak Spanish. So I think I have to like. Yeah, it's, it's no longer a choice. It's like I have to do it. You know. I think I, I wish it was uh, I wish it was offered in schools more as like just a second language. Right. Like you right. Need like to it know is in Europe. Word. Like yeah. English is offered in Europe as a you know, another primary language. Right. right. Yeah. And it's amazing when you go to those places and how small I feel when someone just flips English right. from wherever. I, I was on a tour with a band and I was doing merchandise for them and I was standing back there and like every night people would come up and what we were in 17 different countries and they would come up and they'd be speaking in their language. And instantly I would just say, I only speak English, uh, my bad. And they'd just go, Oh, okay. I'll take that one. And I was like, (laughs) Oh my God, that would be so nice. And I wish I knew your language, but it was, yeah, Yeah. I wish that it was, yeah, I wish it was presented because I think it opens up a different avenue of your mind to learning a different language. I'm sure you can attest to that when yeah. you were young learning. Right, right, right. It opens you up to culture and yeah, there's a lot in language. Actually, I was telling someone the other day, I was like in um, Hong Kong, when you go to Hong Kong, I mean, like they don't really, the Cantonese people, um, I don't want to generalize at all, but you know, it's, it's a totally different um, treatment as soon as somebody speaks to them in Cantonese. Like someone who's very stern, like, no, you know, he'll open up and he becomes so friendly and, and dynamic and so forth. So I think language is just, it opens you up to a whole new world. Yeah. And how many communications are we not able to have? How many like interactions and connections do we miss out on just because of language? So yeah, yeah maybe I need that my goal this year. Right. I think, you know, I think everyone goal. listening, let's make it our goal yeah. the, this year from right now, when you right. hear this hit right. pause, <laughs> go learn a language and come back. Right, right, right. If, I wish it was that quick too. She's like, I know. <laughs> is Rosetta Stone still a thing? <laughs> or I is know it it's out there. Right I don't yeah. know if it's the preferred method anymore, but I know, I'm, I know they're still doing, doing okay. stuff, but I think it's, I don't know if they have an app or anything. I've seen so many different apps come up these days too, of like, try this new language app. And it's right. Like, yeah. Well, grab one of those. Yeah. Grab, one grab your preferred one. one. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have two more questions for you. Where? And then I will get you back to your evening. Um, the first question is, what would you want the world to know about you? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a nice one, huh? That's a good question. What would I want them to know about me? Well, I'm trying to make as much impact as possible in the way that I know, and that's all that matters, right? We all have our little gifts and um, we all have our magic. So I would like to spread the magic that I was born with, I have in me to as many people as possible and do good with that in any way possible. Um, One person comes and, and interacts with me or someone from my company or wherever and, and learn something about aging that changes their entire life or the trajectory of their life. That would be amazing. And I also um, have been a byproduct of mentors. Like I think mentors have shaped my life tremendously. I wouldn't be here with, if it wasn't for my mentors. So if I could be a mentor to anyone out there that I, I would have done my, my life's life's work. <laughs> so yeah that's really beautiful thank you i love that yeah use use your magic it doesn't have to be someone else's whatever gift you have whatever voice you have whatever strength you have use that let's use whatever we have to make this world a collectively better place yeah and you know being um an immigrant when you when you come to the u.s especially, I mean, we talked about coming and children, how do children treat you? One thing that you learn is to, to blend in and, and be adaptable. Like 
you know, be likable. And, and so you become a natural people pleaser in a sense. And I find this trait to be very common amongst other immigrant children. Um, so I really struggle with this concept of authenticity, be your authentic self. When you like try to adapt and, and assimilate your entire life, how do you now say, okay, I want to be me and I want to paint my own path. So I struggle with that um, constantly, but that's something I, I, I want to work on and I want to continuously do and improve daily. Just be me. Like, yeah. There's only one of me and right. <laughs> good enough. So. Well, that's yeah. beautiful that, that you see that and that, that you're able to say that because mm-hmm. a lot of, I don't think a lot of people would even be able to have the mental strength to say that and be like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working on that every single day yeah. and it's tough. It is. It's it definitely is. tough. Cause yeah, yeah, there's so many different influences. There's so many ways you can go. And if you're doing one thing, then you want to look up to another person. And I mean, it's always a battle with that. Absolutely. And I think part of being authentic is being vulnerable. And um, I don't know when, when I just feel this and maybe it's, it it could possibly just be me, but as a woman in business, it's tough being vulnerable because people, when, when a man does it, it's like, Oh, wow. Like he's relatable. But when a woman does it, they're like, girl, get your shit together. Like, I, (laughs) I, I don't know if you could lead. Are you sure you could lead? So it's like, how are you, how, how do you be vulnerable and authentic in this world where, you know, women are, are perceived a certain way. And, and I'm trying to just kind, kind of come to my own at this point. I'm really struggling with that. And it's a battle. It's an internal battle that I have to get through um, every day. So that's, that's... Well, and I, I mean, as you were saying that, I was thinking like, it's really really amazing that that you're putting yourself out there to be that vulnerable but also be like i can be a badass and i can whoop your ass and i can lead this company so in that way i feel it's it's really powerful for other women who are struggling to find themselves in that to see someone successful in the ways that you are i think that that just goes right back into you being a mentor is, is being able to find that vulnerability, but also that strength in that vulnerability to say like, yeah, I will show you the vulnerable parts, vulnerable parts of me, but like, don't take that as weakness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. I think that's really beautiful that, that you're open and you're, you're willing to talk about this and adapt it and put it all together into a very strong and, powerful position that you're in thank you thank you i really appreciate that but yeah it, it, again it goes back to an, an entire life of trying to blend in right i i slowly traded my my food my uh or Sabzi and all the the persian cuisines for the peanut butter and jelly because you know like so you kind of over time you learn this is what it takes to kind of survive it's a you're in survival mode essentially in a, in a silly way but you are so you know, an, an entire lifetime of that. And then finally you're like, no, I want to be myself. So it's tough. It's a battle, but yeah. I, one that I know we could get through. Totally. <laughs> it takes work. Yeah. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. And I, I didn't even think, yeah, I, I didn't even think about it that way of, yeah. Even when you got here, it was like, even to the base of what food you were eating, it was like, no, like, yeah, well, just start eating peanut butter and jelly and you're giving up this amazing food for yeah. PB and J. <laughs> yeah. And I remember my mom was doing it wrong and that really upset me because she would take the peanut butter and jelly and she would kind of like roll it up because we eat a lot of like pita bread, lava, she, yeah, and, yeah. and most of our sandwiches are rolled, right? And she would put the peanut butter and jelly, wrap it up in the saran wrap and like mom, you're embarrassing me. That's not how it's done. It you swear and you cut it. And like I remember, my poor mom. She has to go through this whole like training of what it is to be an American, <laughs> and what it is to make an American lunch. But you know, at this point, like I would give anything to have those kind of meals. Right at this age, like I'm yeah, silly me. I wish. Oh man, I'm proud of that. I should have been proud of. But I find that children now, I, I, I don't know, but I feel like from what I'm seeing in the media and, and talking to other, uh, other kids, they're a lot more open, it seems like, to other cultures and they're accepting and schools are teaching, teachers are teaching 
um, you know, inclusivity and being open to different cultures. So that's nice. At least it's taking place in a lot of major cities where it's being talked about. Yeah. Yeah, I think kids are definitely being presented with more than I knew mm-hmm. of when I was yeah. a kid. I, I I mean, as sad as it is to admit, I wouldn't have known what to do if I had met you when we were both young. Because I, right. I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have ever have met somebody or been told anything about you or your culture when you came in to my school. So I'm very happy that it's a discussion more in, in major cities. So... Mm-hmm. I mean, kids are more resilient. They're they're learning about sexuality earlier. They're learning about gender identities. They're learning about race and they're learning about cultures. And I think that's very important. I mean, they're going to get hit with it at some point in their lives. So right. like, I mean, you see them just like hugging people because they're like, well, you're a friend. So that's that, you know, right. you have to teach them what's different and why, what, what, concept like the concept of race and all this when they're that young because when you're young you're just loving people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is beautiful that yeah and and through that i think we can establish empathy we could all have more empathy and i think it really starts with relating and seeing the other person as you right that's where that's the foundation of empathy. Like we all believe this thing. So I'm really loving this this movement and, and what's happening in, in schools. They're already talking about this and educating. So it's pretty cool. Same. I'm excited Same. to see the world in the next 10, 15 years. Yes. It's getting smaller and smaller. So that's right. Let's see. I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put out people's stories and from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, all different parts of the world, because it is we're all beautifully human. We're all mm. the same in, in certain ways and we're all different in certain ways and that's beautiful. And yeah, yeah. I want people right. to hear conversations that they wouldn't necessarily be able to have for whatever reason, comfortabilities or whatever it may be, or they just don't have the people to have those conversations with, which I think is a big cop out if people are saying that, but it's like, have these conversations. Let's, let's learn that it, it, it's beautiful to be able to, hear someone else's life and then learn from that take Mm -hmm. take parts of that and put it into your own life and just think about these things right exactly and it's funny because i I, my husband's polish but it's like two people from two different parts of the world two religions two backgrounds two different everything but we came together and there's so much that was similar it was like wow we had the same exact childhood wow and then we brought our families together and it was almost the same exact story because Poland had, you know, the communist communism there. And uh, my husband's parents were also separated, but the oh. father tried to come to America. So they were separated for almost four years. And so it's like, how could that be two people from two different parts of the world with such similar stories? And that's a testament to how the world is, how we are as people. We have so much in common. We have more in common than right. uh, difference. Right. And yeah. I wish we could we could embrace that a little bit more yeah, yeah. that's so beautiful what a cool story Thanks. that just adds to it man that's yeah. so neat i love yeah. that yeah i, love I, I can't it. wait for my little kids to be like i'm half per- polish and half Persian. <laughs> yes. how they see it from their eyes right yeah that's fantastic yeah. i love that mm-hmm. all right last question for you Lord. if you had the ear of everybody in the world, what would you say to them? (sighs) Yeah, (laughs) I, I, that's a good one. It's a very good one. Um, We talked about empathy and I think this is very cliche maybe, but like we could all love a little bit more because that's all that matters at the end of the day. And um, I think it's Maya Angelou that probably said this, but I saw it with my my patients who had Alzheimer's all the time. It was like, they wouldn't remember what you said, what you did, but they always remembered how you made them feel. Because when you come into the room with someone who has Alzheimer's, they might not remember, but you could see they, they, they're they filled with joy that that aggressive behavior goes away. So it, it's, it just goes to show how important love is and how much we need of we need it as people so you can't give enough love um 
So yeah, go hug someone today <laughs> and tell them, I love you. I care for you. And like, how many times do we hold back? Cause again, we're afraid to be vulnerable. Right. Um, and I'm making it actually a habit of mine to send a message to a person. I was doing cards at first, but it just got like too, too much. It got too hectic. A message, a text message is much easier, but I'd like to go back to writing a card of telling someone how much you appreciate them. I mean, we all probably have tons of people in our lives, in our phone book. Like you probably have a thousand names in your phone book. Like go through it on a daily basis, pick with someone and tell them like how much they mean to you and how they've changed your life or, um, yeah. So you can spread my love. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm all for it. I don't, I don't think it sounds cliche and, if it is a cliche, it's because it's true and it needs mm -hmm. to be spread around more. So I, I think that's beautiful. And I think it's such a beautiful way that you present it too, of like, what a horrible thing for someone to come into with Alzheimer's and just how impactful love can be on them. Like that's such mm -hmm. a beautiful way for you to see that and, and present yeah. that in, in what you're saying is take that where somebody you saw the day before probably doesn't remember you, but you know what they do remember and what they do feel is that love. Mm -hmm. Like that's a massive and a beautiful way to show how powerful love is. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, yeah, what are you, you're not taking anything with you. So like yeah. spread the love around and exactly. think of, exactly. think inside of like, you're on the receiving end of that text message of your friend who's spreading that love around and you get a message of like, I really appreciate your smile or whatever it is, something nice to say to somebody. Think about what you feel like when you get that. Mm -hmm. And if we all did that and then there, then yeah. like your friend did that to somebody else and that yeah. and that and that and the ripples, it's, it's simple. Yeah. yeah. And it's love's harder one to of those hate. funny things. Like the more of it you give, the more it comes back. And yeah. the more you try to hoard, the less of it you get. <laughs> so it's like, and just give, give as much love give as it. you can to people. Yeah. And this is so beautiful that you're doing this, this podcast. Of Thank you. Interviewing everyday people. And it's it's yeah, awesome. It's, I love it. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you for coming on and hanging with me. It's, it, it really is. It's, it's, it started from like my story where I almost lost my life. And then I realized like life is really fucking short and what are you going to take with you? Like you don't take your possessions. You don't take all the money that you make. You, you, you leave a legacy and I wanted to leave a legacy of mm -hmm. spreading as much beauty into this world with whatever time I have left because mm -hmm. we, none of us know, we have no yeah. idea. I saw a right. quote and it said, seeing yourself in the future is a very hopeful thought. And I was like, wow. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we nobody knows nobody knows so it's like with the time you have like start right now do it send those messages to people like reach out to somebody that you haven't talked to in a while and reconnect with them it's it's really yeah. beautiful i mean life's you short just, and it's you're right and you just don't know how much that person needs that in that moment you yeah. just don't know i mean it could be the difference of a lot of different things yeah. i mean i've I've, I've gone through my own battles with depression and postpartum and, you know, just that one text message changes everything, my entire day and my outlook and like, it's going to be okay, right? It's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. We're going to yeah. go through this. And you're loved, you're, so yeah. you just never know. Yeah, it's somebody out there cares and loves, enough, yeah. loves you enough to send you that message. It's, mm -hmm. it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Well, thank you so much again. This has been so Thanks. this has been so awesome. It's it's thank been you. wonderful hearing your story. I love, love I just loved love this conversation. So, thank you. thank you for your time and hanging out with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Aww. You're very welcome. And I hope you have a beautiful rest of your evening tonight. You as well. Enjoy. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Beautifully Human podcast. To hear more beautiful stories from beautiful humans, follow us on Spotify and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at the Beautifully Human Podcast. Peace signs up.